I'm Dr. Kenneth Mack. I'm a child neurologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and I'd like to talk to you about tic disorders. I see a lot of patients who have tic disorders. Um, these tics are um, troubling movements that a lot of children have through no fault of their own, and oftentimes they involve movement of, of the face, like eye blinking or grimacing. Sometimes they involve movements of the head like a, a twitching of the head or the shoulder. And sometimes they can involve a vocal tick, which is an unusual noise that somebody makes. So, and so this can, can include sniffing or coughing or grunting. Now many of these movements are normal movements and we all do these movements. And, and it's really a matter of degree at which a child does these movements that's a bother. About 1% of all children will have ticks. And when they do appear, they tend to appear in, in the middle childhood years, around five, six, seven, eight years of age. Sometimes they get more frequent as the children get older. And in my experience, um, the age between 10 and 12 years of age is a particularly troublesome time for patients having tics. Um, the good news is that as patients um, go into later adolescent years or adult years, many patients will show a improvement in their tics. And some people will even show that the tics disappear. Now, there's no medical reason to treat the tics. We tend to use medicines to stop the tics if the children are bothered by the tics. And then a lot of the young children who have tics, they're not bothered by the tics, but sometimes their parents are, or other kids are, or the teachers are. And again, I typically ask the child whether or not they're bothered by the tics and use that as my frame of reference to determine whether or not a medicine treatment is useful. There's a wide variety of medicines that could be used. None of these medicines unfortunately completely take away every single tics. They oftentimes decrease the tics and make it more comfortable for the child, but they never really take away every single tics. And the other concern is that many of our medicines that we use for tics, unfortunately, have side effects. And so you have to balance the benefits to the child with the potential side effects that the medications can cause. In my general experience, children under the age of 10 years of age don't tend to be significantly bothered by the tics. But as uh, preteens or teens um, get older, um, sometimes they do request medications and, and we do use medicines to try and uh, decrease the tics. Now, um, in patients with tics, there's a lot of other symptoms that sometimes will be seen. So about 70% of patients who have tics will also have problems with focus and attention in school. And so they may also get the diagnosis of attention deficit disorder or attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. And sometimes the symptoms of ADD appear even before the symptoms of tics. Medicines used to treat ADD, such as stimulant medications, such as methylphenidate, are appropriate for use in children with tics. But you have to be careful, because the average child will do better on the stimulants with both their ADD and their tics, but some children may get worse tics on these medications. Another common um, concern of patients with tics are anxiety disorders, including obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, obsessions are thoughts that people think over and over and over again and can't get out of their head. And compulsions are behaviors that people do over and over again. So a common compulsive behavior is touching. Some patients with tics, every time they enter into a new environment, feel the need to touch everything in the room. Or some patients need to do some things a certain number of times, like they need to repeat things three times or four times. So that's a compulsive behavior. And as long as the compulsive behaviors don't bother the children or in inhibit their normal activities, then we, we don't tend to medically treat those. But when they do, when they become a bother for the child, then there are medicines to, that can be used that can um, decrease the need for obsessions and compulsive behaviors. Finally, children with tics are bright kids. They're just as bright as their brothers and sisters, but they do overall have a harder time in school than their brothers and sisters. And I think many children with tics, particularly if they have attention deficit disorder, 
should be evaluated more formally for the possibility of, of a learning disorder or a need for additional help in school. And I think that school performance is, is something that these children struggle with and one role as a parent or as a doctor is to, um, and, or as an educator, is to try and um, make it easier for them in the school environment. Most people are unfamiliar with tics and so part of what needs to be done for a new teacher or a new classroom is to um, educate them about tics and, and understand why one of the students is, is having tics. The Tourette Syndrome Association is a valuable resource in providing educational materials. And one video that I would suggest to parents to use is, um, is available from the Tourette Syndrome Association and is called, I Have Tourette's, But Tourette's Doesn't Have Me. And it's an excellent video that's produced by the makers of Home Box Office and it describes a group of young children with Tourette's Syndrome, a form of a tic disorder, who have tics, but also do a lot of other cool things that kids that age do. And it, it tells the story in the kid, children's words. And I think that's one of the best way of educating other individuals about tics. So in summary, tics um, occur commonly. Um, they occur in about 1% of the population. They tend to appear in childhood. They're of variable severity, and some children are mildly bothered by them, and some children are greatly bothered by them. But in addition to the tics, um, we as physicians and parents and educators need to be worried about attentional problems and anxiety and as well as school problems as well as the tics. The labeling of tic disorders can be um, quite confusion, confusing. Um, when um, we see patients with tics, we, we do have different labels for the tic disorders, but I think some of these labels might be a little bit artificial. And I think most patients with tic disorders have more similarities between themselves than differences. But when doctors see a patient who has tics for less than a year, we classify it as a transient tic disorder. When a patient has motor tics for more than a year, or if they have vocal tics for more than a year, then it's either called a chronic motor tic disorder or a chronic vocal tic disorder. And then when patients have vocal tics and motor tics for more than a year and it's disruptive to the life of a child, then we say the patient has Tourette syndrome. But patients with transient tic disorders and chronic motor tic disorders and Tourette syndrome have a lot of similarities and they're not um, separate disease entities. I, I think they're, they describe a spectrum of um, tic disorders rather than separate entities.